Welcome to year two of the Parsha podcast. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. Thanks for being here. And this past year, we went through the entire Torah, Parsha by Parsha, week by week, and we tried to give a comprehensive overview of the Parsha, tell all the stories, go through as many of the mitzvahs as we could, and try to draw as many lessons as we could from every Parsha. This year, I want to do it slightly differently. I want to focus on one aspect or one element or one idea of the Parsha and try to pursue it and probe it and try to draw some lessons out of it. However, if you want, you could always scroll back in whatever app you use or however you listen to these podcasts, and I'm going to keep the previous year's episode up. So if you want to listen to the entire Parsha and hear the treatment that we gave it last year, 5777, you could still do that. But this year, the plan is to take a given area of the Parsha and try to draw some sort of lesson and have a connection, a touch point with the Parsha uh, this year as well. So this week is Parsha's Bereshus. Bereshus is the first Parsha of the first book. We're all the way back to the beginning. And it talks about the creation of the world. And there's six days of creation. And the very last entity that gets created... You read the Parsha, you see all the list of the things that are created. The very last thing that's created is Adam. And then Adam is made into Adam and Eve. And we know the whole story with the sin of uh, Adam's original sin and the consequences. And that's how the Torah begins. But it's interesting that Adam was created last. And the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, page 38a, it asks the question, why was Adam created on Friday, on the last of the six days of creation? And it gives us a variety of reasons. And I think it's it's interesting to, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, what is the order? Uh, what's the sequencing? What's, why is that significant? That's one question. But it's also, I think, particularly intriguing given that the Talmud gives us a variety of answers. It gives us four answers to be specific. And every time the Talmud gives asks a question where one answer would suffice, but we're given multiple answers, what it's telling us is that there is a connection between these very uh, various answers. And it's it's really, these are not answers that are in conflict with each other. Rather, they're in concert with each other. They're, they're telling us one approach, one viewpoint. So let's go through these four answers and see what the underlying message is. So the Talmud asks, why was Adam created on Friday? Why was he created last? So first of all, it says, so that the meaning, that the heretics should not say that Adam was a partner with God in creation. Had Adam been created, let's say, on Monday or on Tuesday, well, everything that happened subsequently, the days after Adam would have been created in that alternative universe, people may have said later on, that Adam was actually a partner with God in creating the world or creating the elements of the world that he was there for. And therefore, he's created last. Because he's created last, there's no way for him to claim that he, he wasn't even around when all those other things were created. And therefore, it's not possible for him to, con- to have contributed towards their creation. That's the first answer. Second answer is that had Adam been created earlier, he would have a legitimate claim of superiority. However, once he's created last, that means that everything else came before him. And the Talmud says that if a man gets haughty, you could immediately put him back in his place by telling him, Yitush Kidamcha. The fly, the gnat, the mosquito, the lowliest of creatures, that came before you in the order of Genesis, in the order of creation. And thus, Adam being created last, that is a means for him to achieve humility, or for all of us, for humanity to have humility, to recognize we're not so special. Even the when the Almighty created the world, he took his time, so to speak, to work on the mosquito, the gnat, the fruit fly, before us. We're obviously not that special. The third answer the Talmud gives to this question is that Adam was created on Friday so that he could have the mitzvah of Shabbos right when he enters the world. 
And lastly, a, a kind of a similar answer is that when Adam was created, everything else was already ready. Man is the focus of creation, and therefore everything else, all the arena in which man is going to operate, that is established before man is brought in. And it gives an example. You have a king, a human king, who is building a huge palace, and he's going to make a huge inauguration festival. First, he made sure that everything is set in place, everything's ready to go, and only then does he invite the guests. Only then does he have the feature presentation. Similarly, the Almighty is created in the whole world, and the guest, so to speak, is humanity. And therefore, everything else that is there to facilitate the ultimate purpose is created first. So everything that preceded Adam, that was not the objective, the purpose of creation. The purpose of creation is Adam, is mankind. And therefore, first you create, first the Almighty created everything that's needed to, for, to, to have this world where Adam can reside. And once that's ready, Adam is created, thus he's created last. Those are the four answers to the Talmud's question. And each one of them, I think, on their own uh, would be sufficient. If, if, we, if the question was, well, why wasn't Adam created on Monday or Sunday or Tuesday or, or Thursday, day five, day four, whatever, each one of these independently would have been sufficient on their own. But the fact that we're given four, I think perhaps is showing us that there is, the, the Talmud here is revealing to us a, an important insight that is necessary or, or that is helpful for us to understand why Adam was created to begin with, what's the purpose of creation, and that will reveal to us how we can maximize our stay here on this uh, planet in this, or in this lifetime. So how does it begin? It begins with an astonishing statement that had Adam been created on Monday, people would say God didn't create the whole world by himself. God had a helper. Who's that? Man. Man can also be creative. Man could be an inventor, can devise new things. And therefore, when God created other things, it wasn't just God alone. That's what the heretics would say. Man helped him. Now, what's really interesting about that is that there is a qualitative difference between everything that we can create and everything that God can create. The Nefesh HaChaim, the great Rabbi Chaim Velazhner, in his book, he writes that there are two important distinctions between everything that we can create and everything that God creates. Yes, we can be creative. Yes, we can devise new inventions and innovations. Indeed, only mankind and God share that quality. Only we, uh, we're created, so to speak, in the image of God. We have a commonality with God. We too are creators. But there's a difference. A twofold difference. First of all, when God creates, when God created, it's ex nihilo, yesh me'ayin, something out of nothing. Anything that we create, we have to have existing materials to formulate and to repurpose and to craft into something else. We can create matter. We can manipulate matter, but we can't create matter out of nothing. It's not possible. Whereas the Almighty creates something out of nothing, ex nihilo. That's the first difference. Second difference is that whatever we create, it doesn't have a life of its own. It doesn't, so to speak, self-replicate and go on to do other things outside of the specter of whatever we create, whatever is implanted in it. You know, one of the great problems of, of computer science is creating artificial, general artificial intelligence. To create a computer that acts on its own, that has personality, that has um, uh, variance, that lives on its own outside of the creator's programming is very difficult because 
it runs into this problem that our cr- creative capacities are limited. We can't create something that lives on its own. So as an example, the Talmud tells us, which is relevant to the second answer of uh, this question, the Talmud tells us that if all of humanity, all of the collective wisdom and ingenuity of all of humanity, of all of history, if we could gather them all together and have them work 24-7, think about how much you could accomplish. You could build cities, you could build technologies, you could develop medicines. Think about the collective accomplishments of all of humanity over the past 100 years or the past 1,000 years, the past 5,000 years. There's a lot that we can do. You think about this. Well, what can one person do? Think about how much 10 people or 100 people or or if 10 billion people could do. Says the Talmud. If you got all that human creative power and you coalesced it all into one creative energy, we would still not be able to create a single fruit fly. That very entity, that lowly creature that was created before us, it was created by God and by God alone. And if we tried to replicate it, think about how insignificant one fruit fly There's billions of them, and there's billions of different creatures and species. This is the simplest one. If we try to do it, says the Talmud, we can't. And the reason why is, yes, comparatively, compared to all the other things that God creates, it's not so significant, it's not so sophisticated, but it shares the quality of a godly creation and not a human creation. It has a life of its own. It can, one fruit fly can procreate and create other flute flies. It exists be on its own beyond the initial creation. It can self-replicate. There's nothing that we could do to equal that ability. That's God's creation. Yet we're told that had mankind existed before creation was over, the heretics would say, you know who created all these things? It wasn't just God, it was man. Which is astonishing, because we know that man can create these kinds of things, yet they would claim that he can. And I think the first answer to the question of why Adam's created on Friday, I think it really reveals to us what the critical underlying problem of mankind is. What is it that we're here for? Where can we go wrong? And what what must we avoid? What it's telling us is that there is this, that there's a tendency towards haughtiness, towards amplification of what we really are, and by doing that, also rejecting the primacy of God. We say, God's not so special. Yeah, maybe he helped create, yeah, sure, but man helped, man is just as great. What it does is it, is it, it takes the unique aspect of, of the divinity of God and it takes that crown, so to speak, and puts it on our own head. That is the core problem of humanity. And even though it's preposterous to say that man created the world, we know we can't do that, doesn't matter how preposterous it is, that is where we would be going had man would have been created earlier. So what this is telling us, right at the beginning, it's telling us that we have a tendency towards haughtiness and thus rejection of God. And that's the first answer why man was created on Friday. What's the next answer? Well, if we do get haughty, we have to remind ourselves that we're not so special. Even the fruit fly came before us. We have to curb our tendency towards arrogance, towards haughtiness, towards rejection of God. We have to thwart the notion that we have this crown of God on our heads and not God, and thus reduce our arrogance by saying that even the gnat, even the lowliest of creatures, preceded us. There's an interesting episode in the book of Gittin, in the Talmud on page 56b, 
regarding Titus. Titus is one of the villains of Jewish history. He destroyed, he was the Roman general who became emperor, but he destroyed the second temple. He was the son of Vespasian. Vespasian, in middle of the siege of Jerusalem in the year 69, was called back to Rome to become emperor, and he gave over the siege to his son Titus, and he finished off what his father began, and he would eventually become Roman emperor on his own right. But there's a story in the Talmud about Titus uh, that when he was, after he destroyed the temple, he felt invincible. And he announces to God, you can't touch me. Once I'm on land, I'm safe. Only Pharaoh, Pharaoh made the mistake of going into the water. Sisera made the mistake of going into the water. I'm going to stay on land. And if God is so mighty, let him come after me. And a prophetic voice announced, Russia, Ben Russia, you're a wicked person, the son of a wicked person. You're the great, great grandson. You're the scion of Esau. You think you're so mighty? I have a small creature in my world, and it's called the Yitush. It's called the gnat. It's the fruit fly. It's so tiny. It's so microscopic. It's so insignificant. I'm going to use that as my proxy to battle with you. And right away, a fruit fly comes, goes up his nose, and starts pecking at his brain. And for the next seven years, there's this gnat that is like taking like a sledgehammer and slowly consuming and chewing at his innards and driving him nuts. So he has this this terrible pain and his his brain matter is slowly being depleted by this fruit fly. And the Talmud goes on to finish the story that uh, once he was in terrible agony and once he went next to a blacksmith and the blacksmith started banging on the anvil, making lots of noise. And the fruit fly in his brain, it was perturbed or it was scared and it stopped chewing. And he finally found some respite from his misery, from his agony. So he hired all the blacksmiths to come and hit the anvil next to him day and night, and thus to have a little degree of tranquility from this terrible agony. And they're doing it, and he feels great. Until the fruit fly got used to, got accustomed to these noises, and after 30 days, it started chewing his brain again. And the Talmud says that when he died, they made an autopsy and they found this bloated fruit fly, the size of a a small bird in his brain. That's the story in the book of Gittin. But what this is showing us is that when the Talmud is trying to say um, a creature that's the lowliest of creatures, it uses the gnat. And thus in three places here, the gnat preceded Adam, to tell us about the comparative insignificance of our creative capacity. We can't create a gnat, we can't create the Yutush. And as well with Titus, when he rejects God, once again the Almighty employs this lowliest of creature. And but this the, these ideas, they're all coming together. They're telling us that we have a tendency towards arrogance, towards rejecting God, and we must curb it, we must fight it by reminding ourselves that we're not so significant. Even the fruit fly arrived before us. Well, if we are really not so special, if we are even less than the fruit fly, if we are so humble, well, well, what's it all about? What's the purpose? How do we actualize this relationship that we have with God? The next answer, why was Adam created on Friday? So he should enter a mitzvah immediately. A mitzvah. Well, what's a mitzvah? A mitzvah is the actualization of a relationship between creator and createe, between God and man. A mitzvah is when God tells man, do X, Y, or Z. And man obliges, man obeys. What that means is, is that man recognizes his subservience the fact that he is subject to God, he's less than God, and he's imperfect, and he needs perfection, and God can provide him that. So he recognizes God's primacy and his comparative 
weakness and limitations. And that is where the relationship gets developed. And that's the purpose and concludes the Talmud. Really, everything is about that. The entire world, all that is just the arena in which man can have this relationship. So what essentially, perhaps we can suggest that the what the Talmud is telling us is that everything about Torah, everything about life, everything that we ought to accomplish is to create a relationship with God. And what is that contingent on? What about our character manifests our relationship with God? That's humility. So who had the closest relationship with God? Moshe, the most humble. The Talmud says on the flip side, if someone is arrogant, if someone is not humble, if someone is haughty, that's idolatry because those two go together. Your relationship with your creator is gauged by the degree of humility that you have. Rabbeinu Yona, one of the commentators on Pirkei Avos, which incidentally, we're going to be starting a Pirkei Avos podcast, and I will send out information about that as soon as it becomes available and it goes live. But in Pirkei Avos, chapter 4, there is a teaching that says, Me'od, me'od, havishval ruach. You should exceedingly be humble. And it uses me'od, me'od, means you should be very, very humble. And all the commentators explain that what this is telling us is that the most important quality of someone's spiritual development is their humility. And Rabbi Yonah, one of the commentators on Perkei Avos, he goes as far as to, as to say that the majority of sins, remember sin is a barrier between us and our creator, the majority of sins, they all stem from haughtiness, from gaiva, from not having humility. Everything about our relationship goes askew when we don't recognize and we don't humble ourselves before God. I think it's important, you know, as we're about to start the Torah again, perhaps when the Talmud goes out of its way to answer what seems to be not such an insignificant question, if you were to list all the questions of Genesis, you wouldn't necessarily say the most important one is why was Adam created? There's a lot of other questions. And the Talmud goes on and gives various answers, one of four different answers. I think the overlying message, or the underlying message, the overarching message, is that as we're about to step into Torah, we should know what is this all about. And what it's all about is trying to access and to gain humility and thus foster and deepen and nourish our relationship with our Creator via Torah. I look forward to seeing everyone and uh, to giving another Parsha podcast next week for Parsha's Noah. Thank you.